I'm not an, an athlete or a coach. In fact, the closest I came to ever being an athlete was 35 years ago at the University of Toronto when I was approached by the coach of the cross-country team who was desperately looking for women to be on his team. But I've never cross-country skied a day in my life, I said. No problem, he replied. You're perfect. A and so it was a few months later that I competed in southern Ontario in a competition, and I came in eighth. There were, however, of course, you know the punchline, there were, however, only eight competitors, and I was a full hour behind number seven. <laughs> Neither have I ever been a coach. In fact, I don't presume to know anything about coaching at all, except for my four kids. But I have spent my life being coached by people that I tremendously respect, and I've worked with athletes, Sport people in government and coaches at the Olympic and the Commonwealth Games for years with huge respect and admiration. So you and I are not on such different paths. You are striving to help your athletes reach their full potential, and I've spent my life wondering if I had potential, and if so, how to go about fulfilling it. You are breaking down barriers every single day in your work. There probably isn't a day that you don't face obstacles, big or small. The last many years have presented many obstacles for me as well, as I set my eye on helping a country far away. You probably have days when you feel isolated and alone. It is not easy being the coach, the leader, the one that everybody else goes to for advice or help. Who do you go to? Who do you talk to when you're down? Many days I have felt that same sense of isolation and loneliness. You need to meet people who will make a difference in your life and the lives of your athletes. Building relationships for me has been the single most important thing I have ever learned in my life. These are all issues that we both face. So I hope the story about Pencils for Kids that I'm about to share with you reflects a little bit of your own journey too because at the end of the day, whether you are a coach or an athlete or the leader of a company or a charity, I think that the lessons are all the same. So how did I start? After 10 years of education in university in politics and economics and law, I found myself at home for 15 years raising my four children. Now they were amazing years, but they were also very challenging ones. I lost myself. I lost myself. I was itching to get back into the workforce and itching to give back and contribute, but I didn't know what to do and how to start. So in 1997, I felt at rock bottom and I decided to become a tour guide in Toronto because I loved people and our city. So I phoned a company in the yellow pages that, that had the word tour in its name. And I said, do you have tour guides? And they said, yes. And I told them about myself and they said, Robin, you're overqualified. And I, I begged. And they said, but, but you're a lawyer. And I begged some more. Maybe lawyers are good at begging, I don't know. And so I became a tour guide for a year at minimum wage and I'd come home every night and pour my tips on the table for my kids' count. Some friends thought I was completely crazy, but I was happy. I was engaging with people, and I loved it. And then I wrote a letter to the Olympic bid and to David Crombie and begged to be involved in that too because I loved the stories of athletes, and I wanted to watch a bid unfold. And they called up one day, and they said I could come in for a day to volunteer, and at the end of the day they said, Robin, you can come in once a week to volunteer. I said, no, I'd like to come in every day full time to volunteer. Do you have a problem with that? So for 18 months, I volunteered full time at the Toronto Olympic bid until I was finally hired to be the coordinator of Team 2008, the group of athletes who were ambassadors for our bid. It was a dream job and the compelling stories of the athletes and the lessons they learned on their journeys inspired me to create the book Heroes in Our Midst. 
and we collected 100 stories of athletes across Canada, Olympians, Paralympians, and it was an unbelievable adventure. The Commonwealth Games came next, and I found myself on mission staff in Manchester and then mission staff in Melbourne, falling more deeply in love with sport and everything Canadian. So much so, in fact, that I created and invented this crazy Canadian cheer in Melbourne and shamelessly shouted it at, at every event in Melbourne. So please join me, Canada, A-A-A, Canada, we, we, we. Let's go, A-A-A, A-A-A, Canada, A-A-A. No, it's we, we, we. I know, crazy. And then I took another risk and I somehow became producer of a radio show, having never produced any radio shows in my life. But it was a journey that I kept taking and kept taking risks. And, and then one day, in December 2005, my life changed forever when I made a simple phone call. I telephoned a friend of mine, Dan Galbraith, who was the official photographer for the Canadian team going to Melbourne, Australia. And I called him about Melbourne. It was December, and Melbourne was about four months away. And the conversation went something like this. I said, Dan, how are you doing? He said, not so good. I said, what's the matter? I said, Robin, I just got back from Niger in West Africa. I was there as the official photographer for the Canadian team of athletes, and the poverty was so unbelievable that I, I cannot get the images of the children out of my mind. Now, he said some judo athletes and a few other athletes went to visit a school. They had brought with them. They knew Niger was a poor country, and these wonderful Canadian athletes brought with them some supplies and were taken to visit a school. And he said they went, and 30 children in one classroom were sharing one pencil. Now, Dan relayed this story on the phone to me, and you know sometimes there's a moment in your life you don't know what will hit you. You read things in the paper all the time, in the radio, and you hear it, but you don't always react to everything. You can't. But this one moment hit me, and I instinctively said, Dan, stop talking. Let's just do something. And Dan said, well, what are we going to do? And I said, I have no idea. I'll call you back. And I picked up a phone that day, and I managed to get the phone number of the Canadian consulate in Miami. And I called them up, and I said, um, you know, I'm Robin Mednick, and I told them the story. <laughs> of course, they answered me in French, because Dan was there for the games of La Franca Fini. And I hadn't heard that part, and I hadn't studied French in 30 years. So I could hardly understand even what our consulate was telling me. But they managed to say, I said, well, look, if, if we gather together some supplies and we send them to you, Will you take them? And they said, no, it, we're, we're an embassy. We don't do that, but we will find you somebody. And they sent me an email, entirely in French. And in that email, I recognized the name of a person, and I phoned them up that night. His name was Amadou Madugu. And I called him up, and of course, he didn't speak a word of English. And I managed to ask in French, il y a une personne, is there one person there in the country who speaks English? And he said, call back tonight at 7 in French. Setter. I remembered Setter. And at seven that night I called and I spoke to his son, Mamu. And I said to Mamu, you don't know me. There's a couple of us on the ground in Toronto. I understand things are rough over there. Who's your father? And what can we do to help? And over the course of the next few weeks, Mamu explained to me that his father, Amadou, used to be the Minister of Education for the entire country. And then he was the Minister of the Interior, and now in his 70s, he wanted to give back to his home community of Libore. Libore, 24,500 people. And so I said, send me your wish list. And so now I have a wish list. Pencil, paper, rulers, geometry sets, all kinds of things. And now I'm getting scared. What am I doing? All of a sudden, I have a community and a country who thinks I can do something. And I don't know what I'm doing, and I've never been involved in international development. So I nervously walked into my local office depot, and I asked to speak to the manager. And a big man comes out, and, and I said, um, you, you don't know me, uh, but my name is Robin, and there's 30 kids sharing a pencil far away. And he looked at me, and he said, Robin, I decided this year it wasn't going to be about me. I want to join your team. 